right, this morning, our brother Dan is going to be exhorting us. His title of his exhortation is Truth or Dare. So looking forward to, to that. He's asked us to open up our scriptures to the book of Numbers, chapter 6. And we'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days that he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father, or for his mother, for his brother, or for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. Brother Dan. Does everyone know the game Truth or Dare? I knew everybody wouldn't. We have uh, some people who weren't born here and just not natural. So Truth or Dare, all right, it's a game. And it probably brings different memories to some people than to others. So the idea is for truth, you ask a question and you have, have to answer it. And then Dare, you have to tell someone to do something and they have to do it. So as little kids grow up, you might say, well, um, did you kiss Mary? And you have to answer the question, did you? Or the dare might be, you have to kiss Mary. And that's the way the game goes, all right? So it's kind of like that. So I'm going to give you just a quick intro, um, church truth or dare, and I need some volunteers, all right? So I need some volunteers for truth or dare. I knew I'd get one of these little kids. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> you can't, <laughs> how, how do you get that, you know? All right, so we have one here. Would you like a truth or a dare? A truth. Now, the other one's got to be old people, all right? So, so, so Kiza will do a truth. All right, Kiza, this is kind of an easy one for you. If you could be someone else for a day today, like anyone else you know, who would you be and why? Hmm. Hard question. Come on, just whatever comes to mind. Who? Selena Gomez. Selena Gomez. Is that a singer? Yeah. And because you like her, her singing? Okay. <laughs> Didn't know who it was. <laughs> All right. That, fair enough. Truth or dare? I need some, some older people. All right. We got an older one. Right. Truth or dare? Which yeah. one? You want, you want to dare? Yeah. All right. I want you to shout out the first word that comes to mind and why. Uh, Robert. Robert. <laughs> and I why? Did I did not do it. And why? Because he's staring at him. Okay. <laughs> That, that's fair enough. You never know what you're going to get. All right, truth or dare? I need a volunteer. Need a volunteer? No, I need, I need an older person now, volunteer. Come on. Yes, truth or dare? Uh, truth. Truth. This is kind of an interesting one for a young person. If you died today, what three words would you like said to describe you? Uh, three words. Shy. Kind. 
Kind. Caring. Shy, kind, and caring. I wouldn't have guessed shy. That's interesting. So you get to know people a little bit that way. That's a good one. All right. I uh, need another truth or dare. Truth or dare. Is that you, Beth? <laughs> okay. Hey, I didn't expect that. Which one? Which would you like? <laughs> dare. Okay. Um, this is easy, actually. Go ahead and hug one person here. <laughs> I kind of thought I saw that coming. <laughs> Too easy. All right, need another volunteer. Truth or dare? Come on. Anybody? <laughs> no. Mickey, truth or dare? Which one? Truth. truth. If, you, if you were like Solomon and had one wish, what would you wish for? All right, she says to do what God asked me to do. That's hard to beat that one. That, that's pretty impressive. You have to think when Solomon had his, you know, uh, event, he gave a pretty good answer. That's a pretty good answer, too. All right, I have one more dare. Anybody want it? Anybody big? <laughs> yes, this is easy for you. Sing a line, sing a line for one of our Sunday school songs. Okay, I knew I knew that would <laughs> that would fit you. <laughs> All right, so so thank you. Now you gotta, gotta get the idea here. I want to get your minds kind of thinking, and here's here's where my mind went to. So recently, uh, we were going through a bunch of books, and I was actually giving them away and throwing them away, and I was just about to throw this one away, and then I looked at it and I thought, well, we're about to travel somewhere, so I needed a book to read, so I just grabbed it because it wasn't too big actually. <laughs> so I started reading it. It's called Who Are You to Judge? It's by a man named Erwin Lutzer. And if you've heard the radio, he used to be called Pastor Lutzer on Moody Radio. Um, I heard him speak once in person, and he was pretty hilarious. He's a very old man. Um, anyway, he's, he's connected with Moody. So I just want to read a couple of quotes in here, because I think they're quite interesting, actually. So again, the title is, Who Are You to Judge? Here's some simple quotes. The church, which is called to influence the world, finds itself influenced by the world. True? The church, which is called to influence the world, finds herself influenced by the world. Unfortunately, that's true. The better the world understands the purpose of Jesus' coming, the more it hates him. What the world values, Christ despises. What he loves, it hates. It's true. Older Christians who knew their hearts better than we, sorry, older Christians who knew their hearts better than we knew our own, Warn that if we began to tolerate worldliness, however you define it, we would trip a series of dominoes and the day would come when the church would be filled with worldly believers or Sunday morning Christians. That day is here. Opinion polls show that the difference between the church and the world is in some ways indistinguishable. I found that kind of the basis of this talk. So again, here's what he says there. Opinion polls show that the difference between the church and the world is in some ways indistinguishable. The sins that are in the world are in the church. Divorce, immorality, pornography, risque entertainment, materialism, and apathy towards what others believe. He continues, We act as if what people believe and the way they behave really does not matter. We don't want to judge, do we? That's, how, that's what we're taught today. So we act as if what people believe in the way that they behave does not matter. Many believe that we have no right to judge anyone's lifestyle or belief. We affirm certain beliefs, and then we act as if they don't matter. I'll just jump in from different quotes here. No wonder the most often quoted verse in the Bible used to be John 3.16, and today is... Matthew 7, 1, which is, judge not that you be not judged. That's, that's what we hear, and that's actually the greatest criticism of Christians is, you know, Christians judge. All you're doing is judging and condemning, and there's some truth to that. That's kind of what we do in some ways. Why do we find it so difficult to say that some religions, sorry, why do we find it so difficult to say that some religious views are wrong or that some kinds of behavior are sinful? Why do we allow so much of Hollywood into our homes? 
And that's the one that, like, wow, we do. And then he concludes saying that no generation has been influenced by technology as much as ours. And that's not a positive. So anyway, if someone wants to read this later, uh, it has a lot of interesting things like that, but that's kind of the, the gist of, of his book. So today, as we're disciples of Christ, as, as we try to do the best we can with our faith, we're all kind of like that, that frog that's, that's being heated up in the melting pot. You know, it's not thrown into the, the boiling water and jumping out. Now we're in that world where it's just gradually getting warmer, warmer, pretty soon it's getting hot, pretty soon it's really hot, but we're not shocked enough to jump out. Some of you have come from different countries, and I've heard the shock that when you come to our culture, there's such culture shock. And the shock is not so much about our world, some of it is, as far as the materialism, but some of it's just in the church, how we behave, what we say, what we do, how perhaps some people learn better things elsewhere. That's, that's a shock that's not good for us. So one of my goals today is to make you feel a little bit not so comfortable, all right? As much as I love gray areas in the Bible, in many ways, God presents the Bible in black and white. There's, you know, this way and that way. Starts right in the beginning, right in Genesis 1. Five times the word separate is mentioned in Genesis 1. So God separates the light from the darkness. He creates day, he creates night. Right away, these themes pour throughout Scripture. You have right and you have wrong. You have a reward, you have a penalty. Believers and unbelievers. These aren't made up words. These are words in scripture. We have obedience. We have sin. The passage this morning from Numbers was about clean and unclean. That's what the scriptures talk about. It wasn't just about, you know, washing the dirt off your skin that, that scriptures are talking about. It's the difference between being clean and unclean. When we go back to Genesis 12 and God first called Abraham, God chose him. He actually separated him. He says, go from your father's house, go from your family, go from your country, go to a place I'm going to show you. So Abraham does it. He separates himself entirely from all of his past. He gets these promises, and, and he's obedient. So God chooses this one man out of all the world, right? And he goes through all these, these experiences and, and offering of Isaac and all these things. So out of whatever, millions of people, he has Abraham. And then out of all these people again, you have this little line going down through Isaac, and a little line through Jacob, and a little line through Levi. Levi becomes the priestly tribe. So, I mean, you, you do the numbers, and you have like 99.9% .9 of population over here, and you've got this little bitty population that goes through Abraham down to Levi, and then down to Aaron. So Aaron becomes the priest, and all the priests had to come through Aaron. So there's... In the New Testament, when we read, many are called, but few are chosen, that's how it really was, literally, in the Old Testament. Now, we're called not by lineage, not because we were born of so-and-so. That's not what works today, but that is what people were called in the Old Testament. They were called that way to be separate, so that, that if you were a priest, you had a specific function, you had a certain job, and nobody else was able to do that. You had to separate yourself. You had to do all kinds of certain things. There was different rules, you know, entirely of what a priest or a high priest would do than everybody else. So just uh, one verse that talks about how we are called. It's in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, which says, Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. So that's, that's our command, is to be separate. So the question is to you is, how separate are you and I from the world? When people look at us, they think, you know, how, how separate are you? And I look at myself and my failings and sometimes how I offend people with words and some people must say, nice Christian he is, you know, and I, I realize my faults and, you know, maybe, maybe you do too. So today is this a time to examine ourselves and to think about how different we are, how separate we are from the world, and how we should be. Because the ultimate separation is going to be in the kingdom. Jesus is going to have a judgment. Matthew 25 is going to happen. You're going to have the sheep and the goats, and there's this ultimate separation. Good guys go over here. Bad guys go over here. Reward, punishment, 
Total separation. It's interesting that the word holiness is all about separation. It's a repeated principle in scripture. So maybe you think that the church is not about us. The church is other churches, that's, that's them. Here's a few truth questions. Do you think you are immune to the world's pressures and influences? Do your words and actions tell people around you that you are different? And I mean a good way. People know that I'm different. That doesn't always mean a good thing. <laughs> Do your words and actions seem to others that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ? And maybe sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Well, our goal has got to be to raise that bar. We've got to raise the bar higher. Whose standards do you and I live by? Do we live by the world's standards or by God's standards? So again, I'm thinking about myself. I'm going to get into some specifics here, but I'm thinking about myself and then just things that I see around me. So hopefully this is of a benefit to you. Consider some examples. First one's alcohol. Alcohol. Do people look at us as a people and say, wow, they're really different because of alcohol? They, you know, the world drinks a lot. These people, they don't, they don't drink. It's obvious that they're different. You look at a group like the Mormons, that's actually a, one of their principles, they don't drink alcohol. They stick out for that way, and that's probably a good thing. The world says drink what you want. The Bible says about alcohol, it says warning, danger, Drunkenness, sin, you know, it leads to problems. Recently, Beth and I were at a uh, Christadelphian family's dinner, and the brother there had three beers during dinner. And I took note of it. I was actually counting as he was drinking. I, I, I'm into counting things. Um, and I was really taken aback. I thought, wow, you know, that just didn't seem like a brother in Christ, something they should do. Three beers during dinner. There's a Pretty good sized guy, but still, that, that didn't seem like a great standard to me. Another subject, premarital sex. The world says it's a good thing. They actually say it's great for practice. It'll help you know how your marriage is gonna work out, whether you're compatible. That's what the world tells us. Now, the Bible says the opposite, of course pretty much says simply, no, wait, don't touch, sin, and warning. So Matthew 15, Jesus says this, Matthew 15, 18, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things that defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Sometimes even in our own community, we think that this is again, that's other people that might ex be accepting of that. Maybe other Christians are accepting of premarital sex. We got an issue in our church. It's, it's, it's a problem. So that's why I'm, ask, I'm bringing this up. Another one, abortion. The world pretty much in our little world here says, yes, it's a woman's choice, woman's decision, woman's body. Our country allows it. It's very common throughout our country and our world. If we go along with, with our culture, we don't question it. If we read the Bible, we, I hope, get a very different answer. I certainly do. Here's one passage just from, from a psalm, and there's... A lot of passages like this. Psalm 139, verse 13. The psalmist says, For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. So you add that together with people like John the Baptist who were given the Holy Spirit while in their mother's womb. There's enough evidence for us pretty clearly to say that life begins at conception. Yet the world says over here, the Bible says over here. 
you think all Christadelphians believe that? It's a problem for us. Homosexuality. You know what the world says. It's been greatly influenced by Hollywood. The world says homosexuality is okay. It's a choice. It's a lifestyle. No problem. Don't judge. We know what the Bible says. The Bible says homosexuality is sin. It says it consistently. It says repeatedly. It's something we need to be clear on. Here's another one. Clothes, piercings, tattoos, plastic surgery, all that stuff. Do we really appear any different than people outside this church? Like people come look at this church, that church, look at, look at the, whatever this building is next door. Think people see us any differently? I mean, I'm not wearing a tie or a whatever, a priestly garment or anything. You know, maybe I should, I don't know. Should we appear differently than people around us? I think it would be nice if sisters wore veils. Paul told sisters to wear veils at some point, some reason. You see people like Amish and Mennonites, they stand out greatly. You look at them, like you get the reaction. Either you like it or you don't like it. Like, man, that's so backwards there. <laughs> they lost it. Or you say, wow, that's pretty respectable. There's something to what they do. They really have a belief that, that affects how they act. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. I always think about it. I wonder if I'm in trouble here because of my chocolate habit. Like, <laughs> you know, I get too fat and I'm... <laughs> And it's all because of chocolate, my addiction. Well, I guess I have that problem too. Anyway, con con consider that as a, as a thought. Politics. You might think, boy, we're so far removed from politics, we don't have anything to do with politics. That's, that's for the churches. That's for, that's for the other people. Well, the world tells us that we should be involved in politics. In fact, the world's tells Christians to be involved. Well, if you Christians believe something, well, get involved politically and, you know, make your expressions known. Most Christians are very active politically, and they think it's their duty. They think it's their right, and they need to. So if I believe against abortion, I should be political and, and fight for that for the country. Well, that's one point of view. Maybe that's true. I mean, sometimes you find a biblical point of view that may, maybe that is true. Our, our belief is that we are not to be involved in politics, that politics draws us into a system, that, that the Bible teaches us that our citizenship is in heaven. So if that's true, then my American citizenship is nice, I appreciate it, I, I enjoy the benefits, but at heart, I am not an American citizen. At heart, my citizenship is in heaven. I really don't have anything to do with what goes on down here. So I don't have the right to vote, I don't have the right to other things, and I should really, stay out. Jesus talked about us having two masters, and certainly we have one master that is the right master. So think about other things around us, different things that, that <laughs> think about other things that make us different from the world. Do we support the military? Do we support wars, popular or unpopular? What do we do on Veterans Day? Do we celebrate veterans like the world does? If we're, a, if we're a pacifistic, conscientious objection group, how do we handle that? How do we look at it differently so that people see that we're different? Do we go to R-rated movies? I do. That's not a good thing. I hope from this one of my outcomes is not to, actually. Job says this, he says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? The world says this is no problem. Why are you worried about this? If we're honest with ourselves, if we know what we think God wants with us, I think we know our answers. What do we do with our abundant free time? At our age, my age now, we're empty nesters. We have a lot of free time compared to our past. What do I do with my free time? Do I use it for good or for evil? 
The world has many options for me to use my free time. Got to be careful about that. Financial charity. Well, the world says do whatever you want to. In fact, go to Stuff Mart and fill up your thing and buy whatever you want. Well, the Bible says we should be charitable to those in need. We should we have certain responsibilities with our charity. It's good for us to remember that. Here's something weird, astrology. Now, certainly Christadelphians would not believe in something as stupid as astrology. Yeah, some do. You go online to Christadelphian groups, and typically more young people, as a group it is, someone will say, well, what sign are you? Well, I'm Pisces. Well, no wonder you're blah, blah, blah. you got to be kidding. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. It's a problem. It really is. How about church attendance, just coming to church? We came here early today, and here were our 90-year-olds up front, <laughs> you know, first ones here like every week. We have no better examples right, right in front of us. The world says, be spiritual. Church, attendance, on time, <laughs> means nothing. If we're honest, scriptures tell us a different story. One more, and that's tolerance. Tolerance, that's an interesting one. Well, the world tells us to judge not that we be not judged, right? In fact, there's the world and scripture together. Judge not that you be not judged. That's a tough one, isn't it? Well, you can say anything with scriptures if you want to. So that's true. And Jesus talked about, you know, the guy with the big uh, stick in his own eye and the little thing in someone else's eye. That, those are definitely true. So we need to judge ourselves. That, that's our... That's our job. In fact, at this time each week, Paul says to examine yourself. So that's, that's our first job. The Bible also says, don't tolerate sin. So that's the line. Don't tolerate sin. You're allowed to be very tolerant. So if, uh, you, know, if you wear a purple outfit and he wears green, okay, I got to tolerate those colors. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's like a really trivial thing. But sin is not trivial. So you might recall in Revelation 2, the church in Thyatira was rebuked because they tolerated that one lady, Jezebel, and her sin. In 3 John 9, John rebuked the church because they tolerated Diotrephes. He was a guy who kept people out of the church, and they tolerated him. He was one of the leaders, and they were rebuked for that. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul rebuked, rebuked the Corinthians because there was a man living with his father's wife, his mother-in-law, apparently. He was living with her, and Paul rebuked him. He said, this is sin, and when he's going to come there, he's going to make this clear if it's not clear by the time he's there. So all the examples that God gives us in Scripture is that there's a place for tolerance. It's not to do with sin. All right, We're not to tolerate sin, whether personally or collectively. We show in our words and actions whether we're different from the world, don't we? We show in our actions and our words whether we're different from the world. In Hosea 14, verse 9, the prophet says, this is the last verse in Hosea, whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, that is, knowing good and evil, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the righteous will walk in them, but transgressors will stumble in them. Hmm. Then Paul in Romans 12, which you'll recognize, Romans 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Be changed. That's the metamorphosis. Be transformed. Be changed. Be a different creature. I've got all these bad thoughts in me. I've got all these wrong things. I've got to be changed. I've got to overcome my nature. So, truth or dare? Can you handle it? There's a quote in the movie 
You can't handle the truth. Can you handle it? Here's some truth questions. I'm going to leave you as a conclusion. Some truth and some dares. Truth questions. Are you doing your best living your faith? Are you doing your best living your faith? Do you actively show your faith to others? And how? Do you give God his share of time each day? Are you ready for Jesus to return today? Here's a few dares. These are some dares I'm giving you as action points today. I dare you to stop doing something wrong that only you know about. I dare you. I dare you to start doing something that you should do, and you know about it. I don't know what it is. And here's a hint on that one. Write it down. If you want to do it, if you're actually going to do something, write it down. Here's what I'm, I'm going to do. I'm a, I'm a uh, person who writes things down and, and does them. I'm a strong believer in that. I dare you to start doing something you should do and write it down. I dare you to live your life so that others see and they can note the change in your life. And last one, I dare you to renew your commitment, your promises to God now. Last words from Peter in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. Here's our reminder, because this, this, is, this is where we should be. 1 Peter 2, 9, Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. You're called out, right? You're supposed to be separate. You're supposed to be different. Everyone should see that you're not the same. You're different. A people for God's own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For you once were a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy.